Latinos, almost by definition, are descendants of immigrants. In fact, the term Chicano, one of the terms to refer to Latinos, is an abbreviation of the term Mexicano. Chicano means US-born citizen of Mexican ancestry. In fact, that's true in my own case. You know, I, I only have a couple of minutes, I know, but just a, a few comments about this immigration and then immigration in Shenhoi is, is so important to us here at Metro. Interestingly, and I wish I had more time to, to comment on this, but interestingly, you know, when you think about the psychology of immigration, especially for Mexicanos, one has to remember that this area was Mexico. And so psychologically, in fact, it's also the homeland of probably the Aztec population, which was central in Mexico when the Spaniards arrived. So both psychologically and historically, the immigrants do not see, including my own father, they do not see this area as foreign to them. So I think we have to understand that. We have to appreciate that as part of this debate. But, but I want to end with some comments about the DREAM Act. You know, the US Constitution, it's very important that we realize that the Constitution applies to every person within the geographical boundaries of the territory of the United States. If you go through the Constitution, it does not just stipulate citizens. It starts out, we the people, right? So anybody who is within that, within the, the territory of the US, including immigrants. We cannot have different sections to our society. It wouldn't be a, de a democracy if, if that was the case. Our mission is a college. You know, we are the college of opportunity for any student, anybody in this area, anybody in the state of Colorado who wants to come, come here um, for academic achievement. I want to leave you with a, with a question. If you think about children of immigrants, the children who themselves are immigrants, who came here through no fault of their own, who might have been brought here as infants, right, as children. Children, by American jurisprudence, cannot commit a crime. It's impossible. They can't do it. They can't commit a crime, except immigrant children. Think of any other group of children in the United States that is criminalized. And I think you'd be hard pressed to come up with another group. How is it that the US, including Colorado, for example, in House Bill 06, 1023 last year, can criminalize children and say that they have to be set aside legally? Because in those bills, that is stated, including the children of immigrants. How can this country do that? So that, for example, when one of these immigrant children graduates from one of the local schools and applies to Metro, and they are ch charged out-of-state tuition, which really means it's prohibited for them. They can't come. It, 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 it's just impossible. Why do we allow that? So I would urge the students here I would urge you, for example, to go to the SGA, the Student Government Association, and ask them to consider, ask them to consider some kind of resolution in support of these children, in support of these students, so that Metro can truly become a college of, of opportunity for all students. And I would urge the faculty here to go to the faculty senate and do the same thing. Suggest that they pass a resolution in support of allowing these students to pay in-state tuition so that we can reach out to these students. Remember again, if they were brought here as immigrants, why have we criminalized them? The administrators, the classified staff, all of us have different representative organizations. And so I want to leave, leave you with that, that we really have to reach out to these students. These, these again are our children, uh, children who were brought here very young age, and, and in that way, we really truly can live up to our mission, which is to, which is to serve as a college of opportunity. Thank you for listening. I look forward to this debate, and uh, good day.
Dr. Torres. It's my pleasure now to introduce the president of Metropolitan State College. Dr. Jordan assumed the presidency of Metro State in July of 2005. He brings a wealth of experience and accomplishment to this position. A native of Colorado, Dr. Jordan was cited as one of the nation's most innovative leaders in higher education in the book, The Entrepreneurial College President. The authors recognized Dr. Jordan for his capacity, and I quote, to question the status quo and generate innovative ideas. Please join me in welcoming President Stephen M. Jordan. Thank you, Ron, and good afternoon, and welcome to Immigration, Economic Boom or Bust, sponsored by Metropolitan State College of Denver. We're truly excited to be hosting this event today and honored by the presence of its two noted speakers, former Governor Richard Lamb and economist Benjamin Powell. Both Governor Lamb and Dr. Powell have been outspoken on this issue of immigration. Their opinions and perspectives on the issue regularly appear in the mainstream media. Their opinions also are rather divergent from each other, so I expect we're going to have a rather spirited debate this afternoon. And I would like to personally thank Governor Lamb and Dr. Powell, as well as our moderator, CBS News reporter Ana Alejo, for participating in today's event. As president of Metro State, it brings me particular pleasure to host events such as today's debate. I believe it is a critical part of education and indeed of democracy, to hear many voices expressing different points of view with respect and civility. It is particularly important for college campuses to serve as a place for civil discourse on controversial issues of which immigration has certainly become, both nationally and in our state. The controversy over Iranian President uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's speech at Columbia University earlier this week certainly illustrates this point perfectly. As Columbia President Lee Bollinger put it when he introduced Ahmadinejad on Monday, and I quote, it should never be thought that merely to listen to ideas we deplore in any way implies our endorsement of those ideas. It is a critical premise of freedom of speech that we do not honor the dishonorable when we open the public forum to their voices to hold otherwise would make vigorous debate impossible. Well, of course, our debate today on the controversial issue of immigration is different than the controversy over whether to allow a dictator with views most of us consider abhorrent to speak on campus. But the underlying premise on the importance of hearing all sides of the issue is the same. Vigorous political debate through civil discourse is a critical pillar of democracy. Our country's founders framed the Constitution under the belief that the basis of influence within society should be free and open discourse about conflicting ideas and opinions rather than the social rank within which a person is born. Thomas Jefferson said, difference of opinion leads to inquiry, and inquiry to truth. We value too much the freedom of opinion sanctioned by our Constitution not to cherish its exercise even when we're in opposition to ourselves. Debating controversial issues such as immigration is a starting point of inquiry through which we can all come to our own individual decisions. This is an essential process on which our past was based and our future depends. Citizens gather to listen to each other debate, make their own judgments, and determine a course of action. Thus, hosting this forum today is important not just for the intellectual development of our students and of our college community, but for all of us as a part of an educated citizenry. The role played by colleges and universities in educating citizens as leaders is crucial to our ability to support civil discourse and democracy. And of course, our discourse is, in fact, civil. We listen as well as speak, respecting di different, even conflicting points of view. We speak the truth as we see it, and we cite evidence. And we maintain a genuine openness to changing our mind, even when we disagree. 
We in the audience are also committed to this civility and respect of opinions with which we may not necessarily agree. As Barry Goldwater said, to disagree, one doesn't have to be disagreeable. Knowing at the outset that we are likely to disagree and assuming that we will all rise above being disagreeable, I'd like to briefly address why we are having this debate here now. The issue of immigration has a special significance in Colorado. Our state has historically been a recipient of immigration, especially from Mexico, dating back to the land grants issued by Spain and Mexico for territory in southern Colorado in the early 1800s. And the number of Im immigrants has continued to grow over the years. Colorado's foreign-born population is now estimated to be more than 450,000 people, and of these, about half are estimated to be undocumented. Immigration will be a hotly contested issue in the run-up to the 2008 elections, particularly the presidential election. As host of the 2008 Democratic National Convention, Denver will likely be the venue for many more discussions on this important and controversial topic. It is my hope that all of the discussions will be as civil as I anticipate this one to be, and that our citizens will listen to and engage in these debates as they inform themselves on the issue to engage meaningly, meaningfully in our democracy. Thank you once again to Governor Lamb and to Dr. Powell for opening what we hope to be a series of debates on this important, complex, and divisive issue. We do indeed look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Jordan. It's my privilege, privilege now to introduce the first of our two speakers. And I wanted to remind the audience one more time that the you can line up over there at the microphone once the two presentations have been made and to ask your questions. Dr. Benjamin Powell is a professor of economics at Suffolk University in Boston and a research fellow at the Independent Institute in Oakland, California, where he also directed a center on entrepreneurial innovation. He's a widely published author of books and magazine articles, both popular and scholarly, and he's appeared on MSNBC and CNN, where he has debated economic issues. Dr. Powell's research has been the source of considerable media coverage, including in the Wall Street Journal and more than 100 regional newspapers. A group of his peers known as the Austrian Economists described Dr. Powell as having developed an international reputation as one of the most one of the most dynamic young free market economists. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Benjamin Powell. All right, well, thank you all very much. And uh, I'd like to uh, echo President Jordan's comments about how important it is to be able to have civil, open, and informed discourse in an academic setting about such a controversial issue that involves both the general public, students, scholars, politicians, policymakers. Uh, this type of discourse, I think, is, is vital for talking about controversial issues. And certainly, we all know that this is controversial. In fact, uh, uh, Governor Lamb, being so well known in Colorado on this issue, actually had a police escort from his car to here at the debate. Uh, because of it. I, being less well known in Colorado, had a five foot four French assistant professor of economics walking over. Uh, <laughs> but uh, thank you, Alex. <laughs> what I'd like to start with is uh, actually what I consider some of the less controversial aspects of immigration and, the, and illegal immigration. Because uh, I do think that there are problems associated with illegal immigration and legal immigration for that matter, but most involve the intersection of public policy. Uh, and immigration, not the actual narrow economics of immigration per se. Uh, so the first is overall we find a net benefit to the U.S. economy from immigration. Uh, estimates vary. A conservative estimate by George Borjas, actually probably the most prominent economic critic of immigration, uh, he even puts the estimate, his latest one, is at at least $20 billion per year for the U.S. economy. Now, Admittedly, that's modest as a proportion of the U.S. economy being a $13 trillion economy, but still significant, and also disproportionate in some industries versus others. Uh, but also there's good reasons why the gain is not bigger. One clearly is 
are quantitative limitations on the, length, on the amount of immigrants who can come in. If more could come in, we could have bigger gains. Another is policies that distort which immigrants come in. So caps like H-1B visas that stop more skilled workers from coming in clearly hold us back. Other things that bias immigration towards family members versus other productive workers possibly hold us back. Uh, so the gains could be a lot bigger if immigration were more open. Uh, probably the biggest misconception, so I think actually among economists we talk about these things, economists do disagree about how to reform immigration clearly, but it's usually not over the general economic impacts of immigration. There's fairly wide consensus on that. But there seems to be a disjoint between what economists talk about and what the general public and politicians and policymakers say when they're debating this. And probably the biggest one is jobs. There seems to be a fear that if immigrants come here on net, they're going to take jobs away from the native-born population of the United States. And it's simply not true, and there's very little evidence for it. Uh, think about this. We don't have a fixed pie of a number of jobs in, in America. When we have more workers, we put more people to work doing more things. We have virtually limitless demands for goods and services. We get more workers, we make more things for ourselves. If it were actually true that we had a fixed number of jobs, we should already see massive unemployment in the US. Think just post-World War II. Massive entry of women into the workforce, baby boomers into the workforce, and post-1965 immigration flows. Where's the long-term unemployment? It's not there. The same is true when immigrants come in today. It may be true that they displace a particular American worker in a particular job at a point in time, but we re-employ them doing something else. This is what's happened when the women entered the workforce, when baby boomers en entered, and when previous immigrants entered. There's no fixed number of jobs here. Uh, so fears on this are completely unfounded. Those who would have you believe that the number of job, that the jobs on net are at risk have to deal with this empirical regularity that we had massive entry into the workforce and no evidence of long-term structural unemployment increasing. Uh, and there's some good reasons for this, too, actually. We tend to think of just workers who are displaced here, but often, if it weren't for the immigrant coming in, the job would no longer exist here. Uh, for instance, and this actually happens both on the top end of the skill spectrum and on the bottom end, uh, in the garment industry, an industry that's been in decline in the United States, where largely we're starting to over, uh, outsource it overseas more and more, about a third of all garment workers in the U.S. are immigrants here. If that workforce weren't coming here, surely more garment jobs would have already been outsourced overseas. So just because the immigrant comes here doesn't mean they displace an American worker. It may be a job that would have disappeared if they hadn't come here. Similarly, on the high end of the spectrum, and this deals with the high skill end, I should say, this deals particularly with H-1B visas that limit skilled workers. Actually, this year it was a kind of particularly cruel April Fool's joke. There were 85,000 of these things up for grabs for a fiscal year that starts this November. And by the end of April 2nd, all 85,000 of these were already gone. Uh, Bill Gates, for one, has said, hey, I would outsource fewer jobs if I could bring more skilled workers here. Because I have a hard time bringing in highly skilled computer workers, I actually send more of my jobs overseas. This is yet another way that immigrants don't displace US workers. Now, some critics say, well, it, well actually, defenders of immigration often say, it's immigrants who come here and they do jobs that Americans won't do. And I think critics of immigration correctly respond, well, it's not that Americans won't do them. It's Americans won't do them for the wages that are offered. So surely, if you bid up the wages for agricultural work to $100 an hour, there's probably a lot of you who would leave this room right now to go back there and take a job. The question is, would the job exist if the wage had to get bid up to $100 an hour? And there's good evidence that they would not. In fact, we have examples of this. Uh, one example in last fall's lettuce crop in Arizona, actually, two-thirds of it didn't get harvested. They had problems bringing in laborers, migrants, to do the work. The farmers certainly could have bid up wages, but they chose not to. They left two-thirds of their crop in the ground to rot and took losses of a billion dollars. Now, the reason is, if they had bid the wages even higher to get the workers to harvest that other two-thirds of the crop, the revenue they would have got from selling the crop was even lower than the wages. So the jobs simply don't exist. That's another reason why they don't necessarily displace US workers here, because the wage jobs simply wouldn't exist at a higher wage. Now, this raises another problem that often the public talks about. What about wages? When immigrants come here, does it depress the wages of American workers? Now, the joke kind of about economists, or there's plenty of these, but uh, one of them goes, an economist as he goes through his career learns more and more about less and less, so he knows absolutely everything about absolutely nothing. Uh, and to help remedy this, I mean, some of the journals get more and more hyper-specialized, so people who are experts in one field of economics weren't talking to people who are in another field. They created this journal of economic perspectives, and what it's supposed to do is summarize general research findings in the different fields, and then communicate it to the other economists. Here was their conclusion when they examined immigration and the economic research on it. Quote, 
despite the popular belief that immigrants have a large adverse impact on the wages and employment opportunities of the native-born population, the literature on this question does not provide much support for the conclusion. We don't find evidence of the jobs disappearing, and we don't find that much evidence of the wages going down. Now, that article's a little bit outdated. There have been some studies done since, but still, the economists, when they find an effect on wages, it's very small and in only one area. Basically, when they examine directly high school dropouts who directly compete with immigrant labor that's unskilled that comes into this country. And there, the estimates vary. Uh, Borhaus, who's the critic, he has the highest estimate of this. He estimates that there's a negative 8% impact on the wages of high school dropouts when they can meet compete with immigrants who come to America. Other people actually still find zero effect or even slightly positive, but the range is basically slightly positive to negative 8% for high school dropouts only. In the other areas, we simply don't find it. Uh, now, this could be true, and it's actually to the extent it is, almost any economic policy that brings net benefits to the country, somebody doesn't benefit from, at least in the short term while they're adjusting. And that's what we're finding here, but I think it's important to think about this. This is high school dropouts in the US we're talking about, an increasingly small proportion of all US people. And I think the answer is not, therefore, we must keep even poorer immigrants out, but we need to do a better job of educating these people who didn't get a good education in the United States. Uh, so a question comes up, how is this possible? In fact, for those of you who have taken an economics course from my friends here at Metro State in the, in the economics department, uh, you've probably learned that the economists, at least in the principles course, seem to worship that supply and demand. That how is it possible that the supply of labor increases, immigrants come here, yet it doesn't push down our wages? In fact, I was accused of violating the laws of supply and demand when I wrote a popular column on immigration. And actually, I'm sure if there's one point of agreement for us today, it will be that whenever you write something on immigration, you get more hate mail than almost any other issue that you write on. Uh, it's at least certainly true for me. Uh, and this particular one generated a slew, and one was just an ad hominem attack, and I usually just delete these things, but I had had a few cocktails that night when I got home. So I decided I would respond, and uh, we had an exchange that actually got more civil as it went on, and he was essentially accusing me of ignoring the laws of supply and demand. If you have a greater number of workers to go around, it's got to push down the wages of those workers. And I was pointing out the parts of economic theory that say what the exceptions are to this, mainly not all else is constant. And uh, he decided he wanted to run a column. He runs a website, I guess, that's dedicated to immigration issues. And he said, would you mind if I put our entire exchange on there? And uh, I had to kind of proof myself and make sure I didn't say anything too outlandish. But uh, I agreed to. And uh, to my knowledge, actually, it's the only time I've ever appeared on a neo-Nazi website. Uh, but it, it was an attack job, so I guess I don't feel bad about it. Uh, he changed the title, though. He told me that the title was going to be Economist Denies the Law of Supply and Demand, which I thought rather odd. Uh, but actually, after he read the stuff that I sent him, he decided to change the title and was Economics Profession Denies the Laws of Supply and Demand. Uh, so what are we getting at here? How? Well, first of all, there's a question. Is there a such thing as, quote, the supply of labor? Or are different units of labor have different characteristics that make them better at one thing versus another? It's certainly clear that labor is not homogeneous. There's differences between workers. So instead of just substituting for American labor, they can complement American labor, basically by bringing skills that Americans don't have so much. In fact, if you want to think about it, think of the spectrum of skilled workers in the US economy. There's a very small percentage that are up at the top of the skill pyramid, a very small percentage that are high school dropouts. The vast majority of Americans are pretty well educated and have a lot of skills. If we were going to put a picture to it, it would look kind of like a diamond. A few people at the top, a few people at the bottom, real fat in the middle. Think about the immigrant population that comes here. What does that look like? Exactly the opposite. There's a high percentage of highly skilled immigrants who come here, and a high percentage of very low skilled immigrants who come here. And there's probably good reasons why. At the lowest end of the spectrum, these are the people who are most desperately poor in their own home countries and need to do anything they can to get by and support their families, and they'll take great risks to come here. At the very top end, they're people who might be better informed about opportunities and maybe have the most uh, overall economic gains from coming here when they move from a poor institutional environment to a better one here in the United States. Uh, the middle class does move here, but just not as great a proportions as the other two. And this actually bears it out when we look at the data in America. Uh, across the country, native-born population makes, only, makes up only about one-third out of those who are high school dropouts here in the country. Two-thirds are immigrants who come in. Similarly, when you look at those who hold PhDs, only 28% of Americans, or 28% of people with PhDs in the United States were native-born. Over 70% were born overseas. What's this telling us is, the immigrants who are coming here, tend not to be substitutes for American labor. They tend to be what we call complements. They possess skills that we don't, which frees us up to do other things that we're better skilled at. 
If you think about a low-skilled immigrant, what do they add to the economy when they come here? And you say, look, they're only doing this little task that doesn't add very much value. Well, you have to say, well, would that task get done anyway? And does it free up an American worker to do something that they're more productive at then? Uh, a personal example, actually, uh, I live in Boston now, but the last four years I lived in California. Uh, with real estate prices there, I had a backyard like maybe one-eighth the size of the stage. Uh, but it was all sloped and nasty. The trees were pressed up against the house. I wanted to take care of it. I had one estimate for about $10,000. I said, no way. I had another one for about five. I said, well, maybe. I wasn't sure. Maybe I'd do it myself. As it turns out, I'd probably still be digging if I had tried. Uh, I was overestimate, underestimating how much those to be done. Uh, but at the same time, a consulting project came through for me at the same week. And it was going to pay me more than it was going to cost to have my backyard done. I said, well, I could spend about a week doing the backyard, or I could spend a week writing this consulting paper. By having immigrant labor here who could do the backyard, it freed me up to write a consulting paper that otherwise would have never come into existence. Or, and so this, on net, society is richer, or at least I hope it's richer, by one policy paper that would have otherwise not existed. And it only existed because the immigrant labor was there to free me up. Similarly, if you have a doctor, a real doctor, you know, a medical doctor, who's doing, who's doing uh, you know, operations and brain surgery, is his time best spent mowing his lawn? Or would it be better if he could outsource that, or for that matter, his cleaning and other things, and have an immigrant provide that for him so he can spend more time in the operating room? Basically, the cost of him doing those tasks for himself are the other high productivity tasks he could be doing. So when we have immigrants come in that free up American labor for this, this makes us overall more productive. In fact, this is where we're getting our net gains from immigration from. It's not just the services they provide here, but it's the shift that they allow the US labor market to do to do those things that we're better suited to. This was Adam Smith's insight over 200 years ago in The Wealth of Nations. And specialization in the division of labor, basically specializing in what we're best at, is limited by the extent of the market, how many people we can integrate with. Now, usually economists talk about this in the context of world trade, but it's also true in the context of immigration. We're bringing the market here. By its nature, particular goods and services have to be done on site. Foreign trade is not a substitute for immigration. Now, the actually laws governing them in terms of economics are relatively similar, which is why economics find most of the stuff I've said fairly uncontroversial so far. Uh, in fact, actually, there's good evidence from this, by the way, about complementarity just from Colorado. I was reading a couple things about Colorado on my way here. Uh, a nice local example, Arapaho uh, Acres uh, Nursery, they have a, a, a business that installs large trees. And there they have one US-born uh, foreman for a job, and he has to have two H2B visa people working to install the tree with him. And they said, well, listen, if we didn't have the migrants coming here with the H2B visas, the job for the foreman wouldn't exist. This is a clear example of immigrants coming here and complementing the skills of a US worker that's here, not substituting for him. Another economic area of this, how am I doing for time? Just, just good? <laughs> Eight minutes, fantastic. Uh, another area of economics on this. And this doesn't, so far I've talked about net benefits to the American population versus to the immigrants themselves. But clearly we care about the benefits to the immigrants. In fact, we care about the third world in general. Uh, the reality is 50 years of official development policy of aid for the third world has been an abysmal failure. Sub-Saharan Africa since independence has a negative per capita growth rate. That's not growing slowly, that's getting poorer. We've done a very poor job with these programs. Uh, immigration is a form of foreign aid that actually works pretty effectively. The most obvious way it works is when the immigrant leaves their country that has bad rules and comes here and is able to get a huge boost in their income working in a more productive environment. It, in a sense, this is economic development. I mean, no one, we, we don't really care that the land where Zimbabwe is, is poor. We care about the people who are there that are trapped in poverty. I mean, no one goes around wringing their hands saying, where is the GDP for Antarctica? It's just penguins down there, who cares? We care about the people, so they move here and that's a form of economic development, but it's also a form of economic development back where they came from, because the immigrants send remittances back there. Remittance is where they're familiar with the particulars, the context of local culture, time and place there. They know which family members and friends to send to. They get feedback from other friends and family members in the area telling them how well it's being used or if it's just their brother-in-law stealing it to drink. These things get feedback, actually. When we do official development aid, we work through our own bureaucracies here in the United States to our international bureaucracies to the third world corrupt governments in these countries. In fact, USA Today published a list of the 20 worst dictators in the world last year. Uh, 19 of the 20 re receive official development aid from the United States, and 20 of 20 got it from OECD countries. This is not an effective way to do foreign aid. Remittances actually are more successful at this. Although I don't want to overplay it, they're not a panacea. 
The real problem in the third world is bad governance, bad institutions, bad rules. Until they get those right, they're not going to develop. This is at least something in the short term that is somewhat positive, unlike most of our foreign aid programs of the past. What I've said so far isn't that controversial with economists. They might hold different views on whether we should have bigger or smaller amounts of immigration, but the economic facts aren't so, so disputed, at least not in the way that they are in the policy and popular realm. Uh, in fact, the Independent Institute, where I was, where I guess I still am a research fellow with, we published an open letter on immigration that said largely these same things. And we circulated quickly, 500 economists signed it in all 50 states and across the political spectrum. It doesn't break down ideologically when you look at economists. Uh, in fact, we had Brad Duong, a famous economist who's, been, who's called for George Bush's impeachment, and we had Greg Bankew, the former chair, uh, chief economic advisor on the Council of Economic Advisors to Bush sign it. So it doesn't break down the way it tends to in the, in the popular debate. Uh, so kind of the joke about economists, or another one of them is, you know, what president he asked for, I just once I want a one-armed economist so he can't say on the one hand this, on the other that. <laughs> the stuff about jobs, wages, net gains for our economy, not that controversial. What is more controversial is how to reform it, what to do with the people who are here, what to do with public services, which are separate from the economy. So note two things in my talk I have done thus far actually that I'm sure my debate partner will know. So far I've talked about immigration generally, not just illegal immigration. But there's a good reason for this. If we get net benefits from the immigration, that's pointing towards the solution for the problems that come from illegal immigration. Make them legal, not just the ones who are here, but the ones who want to come here. Open up greater legal avenues for them to come in so that we can get these net benefits. The other thing that I haven't talked about so far, which I don't consider an economic problem, are fiscal effects. So it's clearly true that there are particular jurisdictions, especially at the local level, where when immigrants, legal or illegal, come into the area, they spill over costs on others. By spill over costs on others, I mean to consume social services that cost other taxpayers money. Often, the tax revenue that immigrants, legal or illegal, generate tends to go towards the federal government, while a lot of the revenue that they receive or the services they receive are financed locally. That can make a fiscal drain on a local community. A solution to this wouldn't be to just cut off immigration, be reform our tax and spending policies. Either where the services are delivered from or where they're financed from, or also seriously considering what is it that causes these spillover costs. Basically, when people have to interact on a voluntary basis, I have to come here, I have to bid to get you to rent me the property, you have to bid to get me to work for you, that's when we get overall net gains for each other. When all of a sudden I can come in and without your permission I'm entitled to some of your tax dollars, that's a spillover cost. And that doesn't lead to efficient decision making necessarily. Now that's true whether you're foreign born or native born. So this points to some weaknesses in some of our uh, just formats, uh, in some of the ways that we deliver social services here. So it actually leads to inefficient migration, not just between Mexico and the US, but between Colorado and California, Colorado and Kansas, wherever else. Uh, so we might want to consider how we address these problems. I think this is where actually good debate should be. And hopefully we'll get to more of this in the Q&A, is talking about how do we reform public policies so that we don't have these negative consequences. But also note, because we find an overall get net gain of at least 20 billion to the economy from the immigrants who come here, that's net to the existing Americans that are born here. That tells you to the extent that you find costs in public policy, the overall wealth creation that happens because they come here can cover it. It's just we're not matching the benefits that they provide to the services that they consume efficiently. That's the game that we have to play. Uh, not just putting a blanket restriction on it, immigration. Basically, the amount they enlarge our pie more than covers their services. So we need to address what services they can get and for how much and where. Uh, just touching on another problem then. Uh, crime and terrorism certainly come up. Uh, I think concerns about immigrants coming here to do terrorism are valid. We should be concerned about this. But we also need to realize how bad a job we're doing right now screening them. When you have a million and a half illegal border crossing attempts on the Mexican border every year, you're not doing a very good job of sorting out legitimate workers from would-be terrorists. If you opened up much greater avenues to legal immigration so you could check them that they're not on a known watch list when they come into the US, there'd be many fewer people crossing in the desert, and it'd be much easier to detect who they are. Uh, so I think, while more needs to be said about that, uh, I think our current system where we have lots of people who want to come here illegally uh, does a really poor job of it. And for that matter, when we talk about guest worker programs, the numbers that they talk about are far too small. 
uh, far too small first for our own economic benefits, but also to solve any problems associated with illegal immigration. Because the guest worker program started at around 500,000, they've been whittled down to around 200,000, and even that's politically dead right now. But we have a million and a half attempts on the Mexican border every year to cross illegally. If you put in a small guest worker program, you still have the same immigration problem you had before. Uh, so with that, I guess I'd like to close and uh, welcome debate and comments on this. I think what I'd really like to see is if we're going to make claims about jobs, you have to deal with the counterfactual. It's not just immigrants. When we added more bodies to the economy, your jobs didn't disappear. That's a fact that needs to be dealt with if you want to claim it's bad for jobs. If you want to claim it's bad for wages, you have to talk about why there's substitutes, not complements, and why basically economists don't find it anywhere except in the low-skilled laborers where they tend to be, uh, to some, a greater extent, substitutes for a particular segment of American workers. If you can't deal with those two points, you're not on good ground for arguing that it's bad for American workers when they come here. If the argument becomes there's a fiscal drain on America because of it, I think there's actually conflicting evidence on this. National Academy of Sciences found that over an immigrant's lifetime, they pay more in taxes than they consume in social services. Other studies have found the opposite. I think there's room for debate on this, but regardless of what your answer on the current empirics is, it should be, okay, well, let's address our social services policy so that this is not the case if, in fact, there was a negative drain on it. And I'd be happy to talk more about that in the Q&A. So thank you all, and I look forward to more discussion. Thank you, Dr. Powell. It is now my pleasure to introduce our second presenter, the Honorable Richard D. Lamb. Governor Lamb is the director of the Center of Public Policy and Contemporary Issues at the University of Denver, which has the stated mission of studying and discussing American society's most critical issues. He is also, incidentally, an attorney and a certified public accountant. Mr. Lamb's political career began in the Colorado General Assembly, where he was an early leader in the environmental movement. In November of 1974, he was elected at a very young age to be the first of three terms as governor of the state of Colorado. In 1992, Governor Lamb was recognized by the Denver Post and Historic Denver as one of the Colorado 100 most notable persons in the state's history. He is the author of several books and of opinion pieces for most of the nation's major newspapers, and he has been actively engaged on both the immigration issue and the subject of health care reform. In 1996, Governor Lamb sought the Reform Party's nomination for the presidency of the United States, an endeavor which generated, as many of you might recall, a tremendous amount of media interest nationally. Please join me in welcoming Governor Richard Lamb. Ladies and gentlemen, I've really spent most of my political life trying to describe the new world we're moving into. You know, politics is like surfing, as the old metaphor goes. And you look over the, your shoulder and see where the waves are coming. And I have been really trying to think about the implication of what, what happens if as we're on this road to do, there would be a billion people in the United States that we're leaving for our grandchildren. Is that the kind of America you want to leave to your grandchildren? Folks, our globe is warming. Our oceans are warming. Our ground tables are um, shrinking. Our ice caps are melting. Nature's trying to tell us something. And what it's trying to tell us is the world of endless economic growth and endless population growth is over. Do you want to have a future for your kids? Do you want to have a future for your grandkids? We've really got to think about the fact that adding more people and more GDP is not the, that cannot be the end of the discussion. We are, I think we are absolutely in a fight for our species survival. Not only I think that, but literally, you know, you take the Royal Academy, you take the National Academy of Sciences, they're signaling us, folks. They're saying we're in trouble. And we've got to rethink the economist's view of the world, where just more GDP, boy, that's a good thing. I'm interested not in adding more GDP. 
I'm interested in adding more per capita GDP. Now, some of you will say that's being inconsistent, and you may be right. You really may be right. But nevertheless, I really don't want to add GDP. I want to try to lift up the per capita, per capita GDP in America. That's vastly different than increasing the GDP. But to say we add $20 billion, immigration advantages, $20 billion to our economy in a $13 trillion economy, that isn't, that is de minimis. So what are the other issues? Folks who are no longer, when the Statue of Liberty was built, there were 79 million Americans here. It was an empty continent. Of course we needed more different people. But do you really think if we have, we're headed right now toward shortly after the middle part of this century to have a half a billion Americans, and then by the end of the century, this is under current, this isn't talking about the, the, the dramatic increases that some people are talking about. Then by the end of this century, there'd be a billion. Well, I figure, you know, there's a billion Americans. That'll be about 16 million Coloradoans. Well, how would you handle 16 million Coloradoans? You can go 100 miles from where we're having lunch, 100 miles, and you can see the wagon wheels of the Oregon Trail snaking off there across the desert, laid down in the 1840s, and you can still see them. Now, is that the kind of, you think that, you want 16 million Coloradoans living in a semi-arid climate? We've got to rethink things. This is not the world we want to leave to our children and our grandchildren. First time I came across the question of illegal immigration, a bunch of Hispanic Americans came into my office. They had worked for a packing plant and they'd just been fired. Just been fired and replaced by a bunch of illegal immigrants. And these guys came into my office and they said, what the hell? No, we're, we're, we're Americans and they just replaced us. This was a hell of a deal for the owner of the packing plant. Was, was paying like uh, $8 an hour. This back, this is 1976. Was paying $8 an hour plus health benefits. Fired them, hired a bunch of illegal immigrants for $4.50 an hour, no health benefits. Of course, it affects the employer. Of course, good deal for the employer. But how about our own people? How about our own people? How about people to be at the lower end of things? Now, I, I think that the people that literally that have looked at this. So let's, let's, let's say who's formally looked at it. There's been two presidents that have appointed commissions, or Congress. The first was one of the great liberals of our time, my time anyway, Father Hesper. He ran the first immigration commission. What did they find? Stop illegal immigration. It is important to our own poor and toward the, 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 the whole fabric of our society and to our taxpayers to stop illegal immigration. So then Governor, uh, President Clinton said, What's the, let's have a commission on immigration. And he headed, Bar he asked Barbara Jordan, the black congresswoman from uh, Houston, to head that commission. What did they find? Stop illegal immigration and cut legal immigration in half. That's essentially what they found. And, and they, they, they looked at this problem and they said, look, illegal immigration is, uh, is a danger to the fabric of America because we've got to raise our own pool. It's just the same thing that I saw when these people came into my office. And I've watched this over the years when I was in office. It wasn't only packing plants, but it would be originally there would be um, illegals to come in and dig, dig ditches, and then they would do the flooring, and then they'd do the siding, and then they'd do the roofing, and then all of a sudden you couldn't hire a supervisor unless they spoke Spanish too. And all of a sudden, there is this great replacement. There's not a replacement. Let's see who's been convinced about this. Paul Krugman, one of the leading economists in the uh, United States, and the columnist said, says this, um, unfortunately, low-skilled immigrants don't pay enough taxes to cover the benefits that they receive. Um, America, if it's going to keep its safety net, we should look at the question of low-skilled immigration. How about Nicholas Kristof, the liberal um, writer um, in the, New York, in the, in the uh, syndicated columnist? I've changed my mind on 
a guest worker program because of the growing evidence that low-wage immigration hurts America's own poor. The cold reality is that admitting poor immigrants often means hurting poor Americans. How about um, Mort Zuckerman, the editor-in-chief of U.S. News and World Report? So why haven't overall poverty rates declined further? In a word, immigration, end quote. My second argument is what it does to our taxpayers. Um, the, the key to illegal immigration is what used to be single people coming up from south of our border, working and going home. Now whole families are arriving. And so that when, you, when you look at the various studies on what does an illegal immigrant make, um, the averages, in, there's two different studies. One came out at $15,000 a year, the other at $22,000 a year. I think the Pew Hispanic Center says it's $22,000 a year. You know, you, when you have a family that earns $22,000, you, know, you, don't, you don't pay their own way. Um, you're subsidized by the taxpayers. I don't mind doing that, but I can't do it for the world. You know, there's five billion people out there that live at a level, level of living below that of Mexico's standard of living. There's, a, there's three billion that live on uh, two or three dollars a day. And so the question that we're having is, you know, if, if you really want liberal programs, liberal programs demand borders. I can't get I can't give everybody. I've been fighting all my life for universal health care. You think I can give universal health care and give it to everybody in the world? You've got to have borders. You want to keep Social Security? You want to keep a safety net? You've got to have borders. And borders means you have to, you have to in fact, control people that, that come here. I can show you houses. No, I can't show you anymore, but I could at one time. Um, that were, There would be two families living together. Um, at the time, there were probably um, maybe, maybe $10,000 a year, each family, living in the same, in the same house had 11 kids in our school system. Well, today's terms, it costs us about $7,800 to educate a school child. We, we, you know, this isn't cheap labor. This is subsidized labor. You're asking you know, that other taxpayers, many of them close to the line themselves, to in fact subsidize this institution of illegal immigration. Why? Why? So some employer can get cheap labor and prevent our own people from coming up. My argument is that a tight labor market is the best friend that a poor can have. You want to get our employers to go into the ghettos and barrios of America and train our own people and get them jobs, have a tight labor market. Let me end with my last point, and that's a matter of national security. You know, it used to be that if you wanted to do harm to America, you had to have an army that could beat our army and a navy to get you here. That's no longer the world we live in. You see on 9-11 what kind of, um, what, what 19 people can do to uh, our, our country. So the 9-11 Commission, what's the 9-11 Commission? Says we have to have a counterfeit proof ID. I would argue that before you get a job, before you get on an airplane, or before you open up a bank account, you should, should prove you, uh, that you're legal in the United States. Whether you call that a national ID card or not, I don't know. But I think that you, we have to understand that there's a second new world, not only this new environmental world, but there's this new world of national security. There's hundreds of millions of people, as we talk, that are being taught in madrasas all over the Islamic world to kill the great Satan and do harm to America. We have to know who's in the United States, and we have to make sure that we stop this Swiss cheese border attitude. The 9-11 the hijackers had 63 fake driver's licenses. So for reasons of national security, for reasons of the taxpayer, but most of all, for reasons of our own poor, we have to stop the legal immigration. Thank you. Thank you. This on? Hello? Okay. Thank you, Governor Lamb. We're now ready to move into the debate portion of today's event. And I'll be asking a question or two to kick it off, and then we'll be opening it up to the audience. Our presenters are asked to limit their responses to no more than four minutes. Once again, I've asked you to line up over there in the center aisle and uh, 
ask questions. One of the central points of disagreement on this issue is the impact of ending illegal immigration and the impact that it would have on our economy, either positive or negative. Assuming it would be possible to stop the flow of illegal immigration, could you discuss what the impact would be on the economy as a whole and specifically the cost to American consumers of commodities and services? And, uh, pardon me? <laughs> you can go back and forth. Am I still on? There we go. Um, so, obviously the gains that we get from immigration right now will be the first things to go, or at least partially if we close the borders more. Uh, it also depends what we talk about doing with the existing illegal immigrants that are in the United States now. Often people talk about moving them out. So assuming that's possible and putting up a stronger border, uh, one, we're gonna have a severe short-term shock to our economy because they're not just evenly distributed. It's not just 20 billion in a $13 trillion economy that's clustered in particular industries. So it's estimated right now that about 24% of all farm jobs, 17% of all cleaning jobs, 27% of all butchery jobs, a large number of construction jobs, immigrants tend to cluster in these industries. If we tap down on illegal immigration and move the ones out who are here in those industries now, that's where you're gonna see the biggest effects, both in terms of uh, losses for U.S. businesses that currently employ them and work in them, and also that's where you're also going to see the increase in prices for American consumers, and, and quite frankly, the lack of ability of, or lack of supply of some goods that Americans demand. Uh, on another note, since I only use two minutes to answer that, I'd just like to say about this per capita GDP thing. I agree completely. What we care about is that not just a bigger pie. We help care about a bigger slice of the pie for everybody who's here. Uh, but in fact, that's what I was talking about. When I was talking about 20 billion. That's two existing Americans. So divide by 300 million people, and there you got your per capita gain from immigration. Uh, but this notion that there's these other things that we're running out of, and if they come to America, we're going to run out. This is nothing new. Economists have heard this objection for centuries, with Thomas Malthus being the first and foremost among them. But we hear it again and again that the evidence, whenever we look to see what is it that we're running out of, that they said we were going to, they're wrong. And what are they missing? the greatest resource, or what Julian Simon called the ultimate resource, human ingenuity. Why is it that we have the standard of living and the goods and services that we do? It's because of the creative ways humans have cooperated, innovated, created new technologies and capital to give us these things, and they end up economizing on those resources that become more scarce. This is why Julian Simon had a famous bet 20 years ago with an environmentalist who made exactly this claim. He said, name 10 resources that we're running out of. If we're really running out of them, the price should be higher 10 years from now. They made the bet. He was right, the other guy was wrong, they weren't running out of it, they made the same bet again, and he was right again. Basically, human ingenuity trumps this, that's why I'm not particularly concerned about increased population. But the slight asterisk, that if you're in an area where there's common property and you can spill over cost to others, then you can have negative consequences. So think of some common grazing lands in Africa or something like that, where actually increased population growth rates ends up depleting resources because you don't bear the cost of your actions. Uh, you can spill over the grazing on other people. That's a concern. So to the extent that we have those type of problems, which are much less severe here in America than other parts of the world, uh, that's what we should be worried about. And in fact, to the extent we have, since we have less of them here in America, we'd be better off from a global environmental standpoint if more of the poor in the world had actually moved to America instead of staying where they are where they can spill over more of the cost to others. And, uh, Um, I do think that there has to be going to be some adjustment in our economy and in our structure of business. I think that um, a lot of that would be positive, as I mentioned before, and I don't want to repeat. But you, you ask, for instance, I mean, it's often said you want to pay five dollars a head for uh, a head of lettuce. Um, so I looked up the, late, the latest study that I could find anyway. But the average family paid fifty-two hundred dollars in food in the year two thousand. Uh, $322 of that was spent on fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, so, uh, you know, most of the cost of almost anything we buy in a grocery store is not the people who pick it. You can double their wages, and you're, but you're not going to find much increase in the price of uh, any of this stuff. It's the middlemen that's all, all the, that is the problem. So I would really argue that it is not a problem in terms of the foodstuffs. Um, but to the extent that it is, and I do believe that there is a need for a certain um, labor to pick, uh, to pick Colorado's peaches and to harvest them, that we should do it on a guest worker program. Because I think that there are really lots of people that would like to come to the United States. They don't want to necessarily move here, but they would like to come as guest workers, earn money that they can send home. So I would think that, the, that, that, that that's not the end of the argument. My main argument really is 
that um, there's a that, that we have to rethink this very idea of immigration. There's five billion people out there. How many of them do you want? Or six billion people out there? But how many of them do you want? And do you think live satisfied lives in our country? Okay, some have proposed creating a new migrant worker visa for undocumented immigrants. This would be subject, although obviously they would not be undocumented if they earn this visa, they would be subject to US labor laws and pay federal, state, and local taxes in one form or another. Instead of pay, paying Social Security and Medicaid, the new visa would pay the same amount into an immigrant health fund. Governor Lane, why don't you take this one first? Well, who's going to pay for educating the kids? Are they going to be able to bring their kids? Are they going to be able to bring their families? Who's going to pay for the education of their kids? Who's going to pay for their health care? Cheap labor is economic cocaine to our employers. They love the econ cheap labor. They'll do anything. They don't care about you. They don't care about our poor people. They'll do anything for to get cheap labor. And so I'm very suspicious about this kind of thing. But yes, I do believe some of it is necessary, but I think there ought to be controlled guest workers coming in and then leaving. Well, uh, I guess we agree that I'm a little bit skeptical of it too, but probably for different reasons. I find the government's pretty bad at managing most pro programs in our economy, and I think this wouldn't be an exception. Uh, I'd much rather just let the workers come here and work and actually address the ways that we currently do what we call subsidized labor now. And I, I guess I'd agree with this, that it is subsidized labor that they can consume social services such as health care and education and other things for their families when they come here. Part of that, though, and bringing their family with them is related to the fact that it's hard to go back and forth across the border now. I think with a more open immigration policy, you'd have much more like what happened in the past where a lot of the men came here and worked in the fields and then would migrate back home and come seasonally back and forth on their own. In fact, when you look at 19th century immigration to the United States, almost a third of the people who came here ended up going back to their home country afterwards. But when we have a closed border policy or the type of border policy that we have now, it makes it much harder to go back and forth. So they come here and they stay and they try to bring in their families, which actually makes this kind of subsidized problem worse. But what's your, how many people do you think we ought to let in here? Should there be borders? Unlike you, I don't know the answer to this question. No more than I know the answer to the number of people who should move like I did from California to Boston. How do we find out within our country? We have competitive labor markets where employers bid for you to come there or to stay where you are, and you have to pay the cost of your housing, food, room and board, and et cetera, and you weigh the offers, then you decide where you should be. Now, it is true that in the United States, we have subsidized labor here, too, because we consume these very social services that immigrants are accused of using. So we don't have a perfect flow of immigrants between California, Boston, Colorado, Nebraska, or anywhere else. But we're a lot closer to it than we are with our national policy. In fact, we don't know the correct quantity of labor to move between any two jurisdictions. It's labor as a market. We don't know how to centrally plan that any better than the Soviets knew how to centrally plan shoe production. Folks, that is, the, that is the race to the bottom of the ultimate thing. That let the labor market decide, again. That so, in other words, Bangladesh and the poor people from wherever it is in the world, we're gonna set our labor market, and they're allowed to come here and compete for our jobs. There's hardly a job in this room that is safe if you're gonna go in that thing. You can, you can find uh, Indians that speak English just as well as we do, and can teach our courses, and can run, run our television sets and everything else. Don't go down this room. Oh. You're selling out the poor people in America. Okay, then confront the evidence I cited earlier. When we have more people here, jobs don't on net disappear. We create more jobs, and we don't find evidence of the wages going down. I, I think you do find the wages. You cited them yourself. Why is it that the top one tenth of one percent get so much money, and the lower top twenty percent that have lost? Uh, status in the United States, and the poorest people, one up with uh, uh, high school education, have lost 8.2 percent. That's your figure, not mine. I think that you're, I think that the I stayed pat. That the best way to help our own poor is not to have them compete with people who want to come in here from Bangladesh, but to control our borders. So, do I correctly interpret you as now saying that the only people who lose wage-wise from immigrants coming to America are high school dropouts, and the biggest effect is about 8 percent? That's the one that I'm most worried about. Okay, unless, is there someone who's ready from the audience to ask a question? If not, I have another one. Okay, I think folks are ready to go. Hey, Dr. Powell, Kurt Vonnegut says we're moving to a two-tier society, the gods and the clouds. 
You bet that's the one I'm most worried about. I think that we've got, we are facing a divisiveness in this society um, because of the lower, because we're not doing better by the lower people in this, the lower status in this society. And those are the ones that I think we have to help. Actually, this is taking a very static view of it, though. You mentioned poverty hasn't declined more because of immigration. Clearly, people who migrate here are poorer than most Americans. That means they bump up the poverty statistics. But that's a snapshot in time. Look what happens over time. We actually have tremendous income mobility from the bottom quintile to the top quintile over a 20-year period. OK. Clearly, there's a lot of interest out there. So we'll take our first question from the audience. Um. <clears throat> yes, my question is for uh, Governor Lamb. Uh, I'm just uh, wondering, when are you going to finally stop using disparaging and insulting words to describe people who come here seeking jobs, people who have been invited here for, for many, many years, and who don't deserve the kind of labels that you put on them? As I recall, uh, when I first moved to Colorado, I voted for you three times. Shortly thereafter, because uh, of my advancing age, you, your suggestion was that uh, people like me kill ourselves because there were too many seniors. You, uh, you got the label government gloom. And uh, maybe that's a little harsh, but it appears to me that a few years ago, you wanted seniors to off themselves. Now you want immigrants to starve themselves. Is there no end to your joviality? Yeah. I, I just, and seriously, I, I would suggest to everyone, stop using these disparaging words. These are undocumented people. If there is any illegality, then the U.S. government certainly is an accomplice. Because we have invited these people for over half a century, starting with the Bracero program and <clears throat> the Tuli. I, I have a, a question about <clears throat> which which involves economics. Uh, and, and by the way, for those who wonder, I am a student here. Uh, I'm called a, an outlier, okay, because I don't uh, fit in with the with the. Uh, Sir, just ask your question. Okay, my question is economically. The white population, the dominant population that is so fearful of losing control, uh, which this is all, uh, this whole subject is about anyway. If the white population is declining, and we are not going to be able to sustain our economy, who's going to pay for Social Security? Aren't we better off? Are we not better off inviting people, good people, to come here? Train them, educate them, give them skill, allow them to become. Uh, okay, Mid I got your question. Allow them to become part of our economy that will then aid our entire country as so many immigrant ways have done in the past. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Let me explain to the audience, though I suspect everybody knows. Um, you know, I was at a health conference uh, here, and, 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 and somebody used the word right to die. And I said in response, we don't have a right to die. Um, we have a duty to die. As Shakespeare said, we all owe God a death. But the point I was making is that we are all mortal. The mortality rate is 100%. So the Denver Post ran a, 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 a column the next day, front page, Governor Lamb says the elderly and the terminally ill have a duty to die. Luckily, we had a recording of it. Luckily, that all the way from the New York Times to everybody else corrected it, but it's always a good cheap shot to use against me. I would say the same thing. For bringing in people from a less than, if we're going to take immigrants, I believe we ought to take them for the skills that they bring to us. And that's why I support the Barbara Jordan viewpoint. We should, in fact, go to the skills, they, they can be from Mexico, they can be from wherever, but we should try to bring the skills in that, uh, that, that make us richer and can afford to do this, but that bringing in somebody with less than a high school, uh, an average illegal immigrant has 7.6 years of education, they're number one, a drain on our taxes, and number two, they're not really going to contribute to your Social Security. The problem with this type of 
reasoning on it is actually, one, how do we know which skills, as planners, all the businesses in the country need? I'm not up to it. I don't know any ministry that is. Uh, but then, this notion about the Social Security and the taxes, for that matter, that an illegal immigrant, or for that matter, just a low-skilled immigrant pays, it's misleading because while they might not pay it themselves, it is true that there's jobs that, does not require, that do not require high skill sets that have to get done. And if existing Americans have to do them because there are no low-skilled immigrants here, well, that's going to take away from the productivity of the other Americans, which means we contribute less to Social Security and give less services to everybody else. So just because the low-skill immigrant only provides a small service, it doesn't mean that he doesn't free up other American workers to provide bigger services. In fact, this is the whole notion of comparative advantage and specialization that Evan Smith talked about and why we find the net gain from immigration in America. You can go out to any work site here, there around the different metropolitan area and you find people paid in cash. We don't get it. Forty percent, we figure, of illegal immigrants are paid off books. We get no, we get no Social Security taxes. We get no federal um, taxes in it. And a lot of the rest of them that even pay are learned to claim tw 10 or 12 uh, exemptions. So we still get very little federal income tax from them. It is true they pay Social Security. Actually, this isn't true. Uh, because we created the individual taxpayer identification number in 1996. It's collected over $50 billion from mostly illegals since it was created. But also, if, let's just assume, for the sake of argument, that they pay zero in taxes because they all get paid in cash. Well, there's an employer who employs them, and apparently by paying in cash in the uh, black labor market for them, he makes greater profits. Well, if he makes greater profits, he pays bigger taxes. That puts more into the system. No, the immigrant himself didn't literally pay it, but by him being here, somebody put it in. Folks, there you got it. There you got it. It's the George Bush School of Economics. Give the tax breaks to the rich. Let the rich make a lot of money, and it'll trickle down. No, no, no. This is not That's exactly what you said. The last person I want to learn any economics from is any politician. But <laughs> OK. I want to remind all the folks out in the audience, since there are so many people who want to ask questions, to please, your time at the mic, please use it to ask a quick question. Go ahead. Okay, uh, yeah, having had a child molested, I learned something about boundaries. And as a biologist, I know that the way that your blood cells, white blood cells kill an invader, is first they tag it, then they do about 20 things because everything's reasonable in the uh, biology world. And then they do a cellular knife and cut the cell in half. It has no boundary, that's the end of it. So I'm, you can guess how I feel about Bush and his total refusal to enforce any law about boundaries. Our discussion about who we should let in and who we shouldn't, it doesn't matter what you think, it doesn't matter what you think, it doesn't matter what I think, it doesn't matter what anybody in here thinks because we don't have borders right now. And I, I, I surely agree with you, uh, uh, Mr. Lamb, that we certainly should. What is your but question? As I see the primary issue, it takes us 12 years to process a legal immigrant. That is third world. Anywhere you have something taking more than several months for the government to do its job, you get the situation of why capitalism works in the West and fails everywhere else. You don't have a government if it can't get something done in an awful lot less time than 12 years. You have pointed out, sir, I uh, forgot your name, that uh, we definitely need more legal immigration. Well, why doesn't somebody point out that we don't have any legal immigration right now? I see that as an issue that until we solve that, we're going to have nothing but illegals. We're going to have the child molestation that they cause, the destruction of our stuff. OK, all right, I think we're talking about no control. I think there was a question. Because the honest ones should be here. OK, we're going to give them a chance to respond. Go ahead. I think your question was about, is there not enough legal immigration? We're going to have illegals with all the problems that illegality itself causes, including the vast majority of our honest and should be here, I would love to see 16 million Coloradans, and I want them legal. No, actually, I could find a lot of agreement and sense in what was said there. Uh, you're you're going to expect that I'm going to react against it, but actually, I think she brings up a valid point about borders. Uh, and for that matter, why immigration to be legal and not illegal? Because there are negative consequences of it being illegal versus legal. That's why my answer is open up much bigger legal avenues so that we don't have such an illegal problem. But the other thing about borders, I think it's important. We all draw borders in our life. You have a fence around your property, probably. It uh, markets what's yours versus what somebody else's and what they can trample on. Borders are important, but we have to distinguish those from lines politicians draw on maps. 
And right now, there's people who live along the Mexican border who have their borders, their property borders, violated by those who are trying to skirt around US immigration laws, who come across, trespass on their property, commit vandalism, leave the people in fear of some of the negative things that this woman has pointed out. And these are legitimate concerns. But I actually think the best way to address them is opening up greater legal avenues so people don't have to cut through the desert and over people's property to get here. Let me talk about this question of 16 million Coloradoans. The most terrifying day I spent in office was looking at our tree green laboratory up at CSU, which shows the drug patterns in this area that we live. You know, why did the Anasazi move away about the time of Columbus? Because we had a 30 year drought. There's seven droughts on that tree green laboratory that, in fact, were um, almost of that magnitude 15 to 30 years. You know, we've been living in a relatively um, uh, wet cycle, but you do not want 16 million Coloradoans. We don't have enough water. We don't want, you wouldn't want a strip city from, you know, from Port Collins to Pueblo. Well, we're probably going to get that anyway. But I'm arguing that we are trustees of Colorado and its fragility, and that you do not want to have 16 million. Okay, we also have people wanting to ask questions on the top level, so we'll take that one next. And I want to let the technical person in the audience know that if a person does go on too long, in a, making a statement, not asking a question, you can go ahead and shut the mic off. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, well, my question was that, would you literally say that we're bad because we come over here to try to make money? Would you say that's a bad thing? For those who live in poverty to come over here and make money for their family, little children trying to get food in their stomach, would you blame them from trying to come over here and make money? Would you? I don't call anybody bad. I am saying it is a bad institution to allow illegal immigration. And I can't use your standard. I, I appreciate the, the heartfelt that you do. And I understand the emotion that comes behind this. But you know, I, I, you, you look around the world, and there's billions of people. There are three billion people that live like on two dollars a day, and so they're hungry too. They've got children too. They would like to come here and and, do, and, and, and be here too. But I'm saying that the best thing that the United States can do in a global warming world is to run a sustainable society, so to, to stabilize our population, to start thinking about GDP, to start thinking about um, how we raise up our poor. That's my vision of uh, where America should go. And it's not calling anybody bad. If, if the concern is truly a global warming or a global environmental problem, I don't see how shifting them on the globe from one country to the United States makes that problem worse. <laughs> and in fact, actually, since we do a better job of managing our resources here, that in lots of the spillover places in the third world where they have poor property rights system, it seems like it would improve it. Yeah. I, what you're doing is, in fact, you're assuming that, that all of those people could come to America and become consuming Americans, and they do. I appreciate that. If I lived in another place, I'd probably try to sneak into the United States too. But your environmental impact and footprint of an average American, you know very well, is substantially more than other places where we're taking our immigrants. We can't, I don't believe, um, I really don't believe that immigration is a solution to the world's poor. I was named Humanist of the Year 10 years ago because of the work I did in Cambodian uh, refugee relief. I care about, I'm an internationalist, but, if you, but I think when you look at the kind of world poverty, how many, how many, uh, how, how many immigrants are we going to have to take to deal with this kind of, these kind of questions, world poverty? We could double immigration and double it again and double it again. There's 76 million new people every year, every year, every year coming in, mostly to the third world. Immigration is not the way to solve world poverty. Uh, actually, I agree with you that it won't solve the world environmental problems to the extent they exist, and it won't solve world poverty. I'm just saying it's not going to make it any worse. In fact, it'll be on the margin slightly better. Okay, next question. Hi, my name is Jessica. And I'm a member of Rights for All People, and we are an immigrants' rights group based here in Denver. Um, at Rights for All People, we believe that the immigration debate is actually an extension of the debate over minority rights, the rights of the poor, and the rights of women in this country, as well as other marginalized groups that struggle for equal recognition as citizens in this nation. From that perspective, especially during their land, if you could, in terms of national security, explain to me how our domestic policies 
and practices to deter terrorism is not, in fact, an attack on our minority and immigrant, and immigrant populations, given the fact that each of the 9-11 hijackers entered this country legally on legal visas, <laughs> and, that the, and that subsequent anti-terrorist policies, such as Operation Tamarack, have resulted in the deportation of both legal and illegal immigrants that are minorities and not terrorists. Fair, fair question. Um, uh, five, a lot of illegal immigration are people who come legally and then overstay their visas. Five of the 9-11 hijackers actually were in that category. They were not here legally. They, they have overstayed their visas. So under my plan and the 9-11 commission plan, I dare say, is that we really have to have a way, if you're gonna, and these are thoughtful people who look at our security needs, they said, look, we, we need a system to know who's legally in the United States. That doesn't, the national security isn't an attack on minorities. If, if people are here, they've got their rights anyway. But, it, but, but what we're it's saying is, look, in a world that is filled with people and increasing all the time that really hate us, we gotta have some control of who comes in here and who doesn't. That's, I just disagree with you that this is an attack on minorities. But if minorities are the ones being deported and not a single one of them has a link to terrorism, is there not a disconnect then in your plan to stop terrorism by targeting immigrants? But no, that's only one of the plans. But it's not the reason that people are deported. It's not only terrorism. People are deported because, because for a number of reasons, uh, they commit crimes while they're here or some other reason. There's lots of reasons to deport people, not only on terrorism. And I don't mean to say it's only on terrorism. Thank you. Were you going to come in on that one? No. Okay, we're going to go back up to the top level. Is there someone up there who wants to ask a question? Um, this is primarily a, a address to Governor Lamb, but um, you know I have some bones to pick, up, pick with Dr. Paul too. Uh, a, Dr. Lamb, as is usual, refuses to, un uh, to acknowledge the ordinary facts of U.S. history. The first illegal immigrant was none other than Christopher Columbus, whom we will be celebrating. <laughs> to, to, to whom we have dedicated a state holiday, the first state in the Union to have dedicated a holiday to a mass murderer and, and to an imperialist. Number two, the political economy of the, I mean, Mr. Lamb touched upon the implications for, uh, for the world in terms of American consumption. Well, that's, that's interesting to hear you say that. What are we going to do about it, right? It, I mean, we have destroyed broad sectors of the Mexican economy with a nice free market mechanism called the North American Free Trade Economy. Uh, agreed. These, do, I mean, so it allows people like Walmart, it allows all the agri-businesses to flood Mexico with subsidized products while driving millions of Mexican families and businesses off the land and into bankruptcy. You, do you have an immigration problem? I think you would. Number two, when you talk about- Remember this, question. Yes. Number number three, if you have to talk about if you have to talk about security issues, maybe we should think about of the almost million people that were killed in U.S. wars to promote democracy in Central America in the 1980s, and that continue today in the Middle East. There is a massive refugee crisis in Iraq. Perhaps it's time we look at ourselves. Thank you. Is there? Now, Response. There's too many things on the table here in that question. I mean, many of them are good. And invite me back. I'll be happy to, uh, because there's a great question. I don't support the war in Iraq and didn't from the very beginning. I think that there's many things that you said which were true. Let me talk about NAFTA, though. Uh, you know, NAFTA, which I didn't have, a, I didn't have anything to do with NAFTA. But remember, the Mexican government wanted NAFTA desperately. And so the fact that NAFTA didn't work out the way that America thought it would or Mexico thought it would, but this wasn't imposed on Mexico. This was welcomed and sought by them. Yeah, I just dispute the notion. I mean, there's a lot of problems with NAFTA, I think, mostly because it's actually not a completely a free trade agreement. It's got a whole bunch of other stuff thrown in there, just like CAFTA that we passed last year. Uh, 
But the notion of cheaper products going to Mexico, when people are poor and they get cheaper products, that means their real income goes up. So actually, it seems pretty good. Uh, and because there's no limit on the number of things that people will want, it doesn't have to on net destroy jobs either. Okay, go ahead. Yes, uh, my name is Danielle Short, and I'm with the American Friends Service Committee. We have a project called Coloradans for Immigrant Rights, where we have people who are coming together to really talk about these issues, mostly citizens who are saying, our communities would actually be better if we found a way to um, address the immigrant rights issue and to provide human rights to all immigrants. And we have a lot of conversation about this issue, not just from the perspective of the rights and the human rights of the immigrants, but also how we can look at the issue of jobs for, for U.S. foreign workers. We care about both of those groups. And we've come to the conclusion that we can move forward the best as a society and um, improve the lot for all workers in this country by legalizing workers. One thing I haven't heard today so far is any conversation about um, the, the fact that the perception on the, on the side of many U.S. foreign workers that that um, their, their economic power, their buying power, their economic security has decreased over the last several de decades. I think that's the real issue. And um, you know, uh, buying power is down, healthcare is more, more expensive, pensions are more, are, are more difficult to access. And if we look at issues around jobs and the role that immigration has taken in jobs, we see that there are other factors that can, in, in, in play which are making it more difficult for workers to defend their labor rights, which is what has actually brought labor, labor um, wages down, and then immigrants were brought in to, to take those jobs after the wages were brought down. I'm wondering if you could comment on that issue. Yes, yeah, so there's a whole bunch. Can I go first? Uh, there's a whole bunch in there, and in fact, I can't answer all of it because there was a whole bunch of tough economic questions overall in there. But a couple, I think, important points about this. One is, we're still not picking up any effective on net jobs disappearing from Americans when the workers come here. And really the only thing we're getting any evidence of is those high school dropouts competing with low skilled immigrants. And even that, it's not clear that it's a negative effect on their wages. Some people find positive, some people find slightly negative. So I don't see immigration as the driving cause on these other problems. But on top of that though, the notion though that America is becoming poorer, here's the litmus test to ask yourself. What does the American, average American family have now compared to 1970? in terms of goods, services, and lifestyles that they have. We're much wealthier today, the average American for that matter. Take someone who's in official poverty in the United States today and actually compare the consumer goods that they own at the percentage rates that they do compared to the average family in 1970. The poorer people today actually have more than the average back then. So I'm skeptical of this whole, I, there are some statistics who could show different negative effects in different segments of the market, but I'm skeptical of the overall view that somehow your average or poor American has become worse off in the last 30 years. Yeah, and you, can I just clarify my question? I, I don't know if it's clear. I was not trying to say that I think immigrants oh. are the cause of that at all. I'm saying I think there's a, other um, issues that are not being debated, are not being addressed, and that immigrants are being scapegoated and are keeping us from, from having these conversations of what the, the true issues and the real issues in our society that we need to be talking about are. Fair enough. Um, thank you for being with the American Friends Service Committee. It's a great, or, a great organization. I appreciate your contributions to the dialogue. Um, I don't know what question that you, I thought you were going down the amnesty question, and I don't know. I still think that when Paul Krugman and when all of these people that have looked at this problem have come to the same conclusion that this is hurting our own poor, the American Friends Service Committee, for all of its compassion, which is uh, immense, I think is really overlooking what it's doing to our own poor. Okay, back up at the top. I'm a Metro student and I have one uh, real simple question. Why is it that this country brags about defending other people in other countries and the people that come here seeking help we treat as criminals? Well, I, I don't think, how do we treat them as criminals? I mean, I, I heard that at the beginning thing. Because because that we don't give benefits to illegal immigrants doesn't mean we're criminalizing them. You, you, you don't have a right to, to benefits. You can't, you can't say, I live in Bangladesh and I have a right to uh, a social security check. Um, I think that you, uh, you know, America's got an incredibly passionate, um, a compassionate uh, immigration policy. We take twice as many immigrants as almost the rest of the world combined. 
Um, we, do, we, take we do incredible things on that. And I think it's really wrong to say, because we don't let everybody in, that that's a, not a compassionate immigration policy. You can't let everybody in. You shouldn't let everybody in. There is a poverty in the world, but our maximum immigration policy isn't going to dent that poverty. The country was built by immigrants. OK. Yeah, in an empty, the country was built by immigrants. Is that the slogan? You really, is that the thoughtful way you want to address an immigration policy? Something that happened when we were an empty continent? Christopher Columbus came here, and that we should say the same thing? There's a new world, is what I'm arguing. Okay. Another question, you're going to come in. No? Okay, we'll take the next question. Um, Rebecca, that, um, this oh, I'm sorry. We were gonna uh, we we're gonna go back to the bottom because there's a really long line down there. Then we'll come back up to you. Go ahead. I didn't, look, I didn't say immigration was the only reason. There's lots of problems in our society. I, I, I understand, but let me tell you, all of these problems are complex. There's no one answer to any of them, okay? I mean, you're, you're right. If I seem to imply that the reason that people are getting richer is because of illegal immigrants, I don't mean so. But I'm saying illegal immigrant, pri immigrants primarily benefit their employer class. If primarily, that's who they benefit. And that's what I think you're defending when you simply say, we want to, we want to turn our back on illegal on enforcing our illegal immigration laws. They don't primarily benefit employers. They primarily benefit those people who buy the products that they, are, they and their employers produce here in the United States. And the people who earn money in the United States, when they're not using the uh, visible hand of the government to get it, are actually getting it by offering products and services to serve others. That's how you get richer, unless you're using the government to get somebody to transfer you their wealth or to restrict your competitors. That, again, is the trickle-down theory. The Austrian School of Economics, are actually, they've got a lot of good things to say. I really do think they have a lot of good things to say. But that's the attitude that, they're, that they really have, is that, you know, that's okay. Employers make a lot of money. Somehow it'll all work out. Folks, it isn't going to work out. If we left it to this kind of a philosophy, you wouldn't have wage and hour laws, you wouldn't have child labor laws, you wouldn't have women uh, pr protection laws of all kinds. Hey, With all ahead. due respect, Governor Lamb, if, if I offer you the opportunity to buy this pen for me for a dollar and you value the pen more than a dollar and you give me the dollar, by me providing you with a pen, I've made you better off. How have I made you worse off? That's not trickle down. That's me directly benefiting you and you directly benefiting me. That's the nature of voluntary exchange. It's the people who sell the pens, Dr. Powell. It's the secret of people who sell the pens that make the money. True. And it's the people who bought the pen who got the good that actually makes their life better. OK. Go ahead, back up at the top. If the land is free, then how come us immigrants can be free in America and achieve our goals and our dreams? I hope you can achieve your goals and achieve, achieve your, your dreams. And if you're an immigrant, you're not welcome to America. Please understand, we're talking about illegal immigration here, not, not, open, not immigration. Uh, and if you're an immigrant and you're in, you're in the land of your dreams, you see, I'm not an immigrant. I'm legal. And you know what? I used to be in a game and all that stuff, but look at me right now. I changed because I'm going to do better. So why don't you go give a chance to those people? My, my, my only answer is please try to imagine. Try to imagine that there's a waste paper basket here that's filled with marbles. No, it's because you don't care. <laughs> oh. oh, you can tell that from me, huh? Well, let me tell you. 
you know, I, I formed and I founded, was the first vice president of the NAACP at the University of California. My first job out of law school was at the Colorado Anti-Discrimination Commission. Our family marched at Selma. Don't tell me I didn't care. We are running out of time because Governor Lamb has to leave at a quarter till. So I'm going to try to get, if you can make your, sec your question 10 seconds long, get through a couple of these folks who've been waiting down here. Go ahead. In the 90s, the nations around the world had a tremendous influx of immigration. In the United States, it was the biggest wave of immigration of the century. At the same time, those economies had a tremendous economic growth fueled by the, the increase, historic increase in property values. These same economies have seen a collapse in property values after that government of immigration. Examples are Spain, France, and now the United States. An analysis of Number of foreclosures by zip code, it runs two areas in Colorado in the highest state, Montbello and the area between Alameda and Pedro. These areas are highly populated by immigrants. <clears throat> Why a few economies, only a few economies, such as Dr. Giovanni Perry from the University of Vegas, mention this correlation? And why the majority of economies don't mention this correlation? Are they biased? Thank you. I don't think they're biased. I, I think it's a mistake to talk about like the overall downturn in the housing market being caused by immigration reform. It does so happen that the two things were going on simultaneously, but it also happens that we were cracking down on immigration while housing prices were going way up. So, but that said, so I don't think it's the overall dark. It's certainly true that in particular localized markets where there is a high percentage of immigrants, if you crack down on the people who are demanding housing in that area and either move some out or prevent more from coming in, that'll dampen the housing market in any area. Uh, I think most economists would recognize it, they just don't find it particularly interesting to study, unfortunately, maybe. I agree. Okay, the next one. Okay, uh, my name is Helen Jerome Rushvik, and I teach a Mesoamerica class here at Metro. Uh, and I just want to make one comment about what happens if the Native Americans had the same immigration law. Uh, the other thing, really going along with that, is this a historical viewpoint, right, really does. Um, uh, contribute to these racial undertones. Uh, and then the questions, I have two of them. Um, first of all, is this issue of immigration, and I'm specifically directing this to Mr. Lamb, is that excusing the American responsibility to the world environment? And I want you to clarify that, because as human beings, we all have that responsibility to our mother. The other thing is, why is it, and this could be answered by both, why is there not regulations um, concerning the big businesses that go into Mexico? I really would like to know that answer. Um, the, why, don't, why don't you you go ahead and let me let me organize my thoughts? Okay, uh, I'll give you unorganized thoughts. Uh, first, about the uh, the historical aspect. Actually, I think it's. Uh, a mistake when people say, and I'm not putting you in this context, so different people mean it different ways, when they talk about Columbus coming here, what if the Native Americans had the immigration policy of closed borders? Well, at least in the short run, the Native Americans probably would have been better off. But we have to be clear what type of immigration was coming on. There's a difference between an invasion and conquering and coming to a place where people voluntarily sell homes, rent to you, or hire you to work. Columbus wasn't doing the latter. He was showing up and saying, I'm going to stick you with a sword and enslave you. So. I don't like equating the two and talking about it like that because just because it would have been a better policy for the Native Americans doesn't mean it's a better policy for the Americans who live here today because we're asking the immigrants to come here and interact on a voluntary basis, not to come with guns and shoot at us. Yeah, but my point there is that as human beings, we should learn to share the earth. That's my point. Yeah, if you would stop, um, if you would stop immigration, the earth would continue to warm, the environment would continue to uh, deteriorate. It's a really good point. It, 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 it's, a, it's mass consumption, it's consumption uh, and burning of oil and burning of other things that is the primary problem. You're right. Very quick question down here. Go ahead. My name is Gilan. I'm working at Metro State College as an instructor. I'm teaching political systems and ideas. First, I want to tell you, both of you, you are here to unite us, to unite the citizens of US. You are speaking in the interest of 
the citizen of U.S. As I observed different countries, I came from Ethiopia through Moscow. During the fall of communism, I was there. There were different debates about immigrants, refugees. Still there are debates. But what I want to tell you is, when we are speaking about national interest, we have to take care and we have to think what happened on the question of nationality, especially in Germany, where millions of Jewish were, were deported and cancelled and, and, and killed because of the national question. So here when we are discussing why, why I'm thinking of you, one of you is speaking about economy, the economical effect which is related with immigrants, and one of you are speaking about illegality or non-legals or illegal immigrants in the US and so on. My question is, let me start from, from economy. As I worked with the refugees for more than three years, almost refugees and illegal immigrants who are crossing the border are paying. The poor Ethiopians, Somalians, who are crossing the border are paying at least 3,000 US dollars. So, my question is, when we are speaking about immigrants or illegal immigrants from Mexico to US and so on, do you think they are not paying? Do you think they are crossing the border without the knowledge of somebody who is working with the security forces? And what do you think about this type of economical effect to the families of these immigrants who is crossing by the support of the other forces who are working the authorities? I hope and I know that without the knowledge of these forces, no one can cross the border. This is one question. So, the second one is... Okay. When you know what, sir? I'm sorry, we're out of time. So we're going to give them a quick chance to respond. I, Go I ahead. very much disagree with your statement about nationalism. It is, it's fascism, it's, it's, it's Nazism that killed the Jews. I, every country's got a nationalism. Every country. Japan feels very strongly. China feels very strongly. Ghana feels very strongly. People feel strongly about their nation, and they should. But you can, you can, Let me finish. Let me finish. I think we always have we'll always have room for refugees in this country. You're going to have to. Uh, yes, you can support or not support. That is the part when when the Germans decided to purify them, saying that we have to purify our nation and they spoke by, by the name of the nation. This is, Sir, this is the part. But my second question. Let me come to the second question about illegal immigrants. What is the difficulty for you? and the representatives of the state to stop this. There are structures, there are political systems. Okay, go ahead. Um, I, I really disagree with the idea that the American government is deliberately winking at or facilitating the, pressure of the crossing of illegal immigrants. I just think that's wrong. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Powell, okay, you know what? We're out of time, and I want to go ahead and apologize to everyone in the audience who did not have an opportunity to ask a question. My hope is perhaps the next time you will have that opportunity, so I apologize for that. We did want to give our guests, our speakers, the opportunity to do a very quick wrap-up of their, of their statements, of their point of view. So go ahead, Governor Lamy, go first. There's a new world. There is a new world in fact. All you have to do is read all the scientific journals. All you have to do is look around you. All you have to do is see the ice caps are melting and that we are in trouble as a species. Okay, one of those things it is because of this idea that endless population growth and endless GDP is somehow an unlimited good. It is not. We're gonna to have to rethink both. And thank you for your invitation to speak. Doomsday.
doomsday prophets always say these things, and they have for hundreds of years. They haven't been right in the past. That doesn't mean that they're not right this time, but I sure know where the presumption of belief is. Makes me pretty skeptical of it. Until then, and in fact, we're not talking about just population growth in the U.S., we're talking about shifting of some of the world's population here versus there. I think it's unambiguously good for the immigrants who come here and for the existing native-born population of America, and therefore we should support it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you all for being here and also for those watching online. Stay tuned for details about the next debate in this series entitled Pluralist Perspectives on the Immigration Controversy. That is scheduled for Wednesday, October 17th. Thank you all again.